Hi everyone, welcome to I'm Loving Lit webinar. It's Interactive Notebook Hacks to Save Your Sanity presented by Aaron Cobb. We are very excited that Carson DeLosa teamed up with Aaron to create some interactive notebooks and some practice and assess workbooks for Carson DeLosa. A little bit about Erin is that she's an educator, a blogger, and a professional developer. She has 12 years of teaching experience in grade PK through eight, and she specializes in creating lessons and activities that adapt to a wide variety of learning styles. So go ahead, Erin, and take it from here. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Olivia, for having me. Um, I really appreciate everyone taking the time to join us for today's webinar. This webinar is right for you if you've tried interactive notebooks, but you feel like you're doing something wrong, or maybe you're doing a lot of things wrong. If you're considering giving up because it's too big of a hassle, or even if you've used and you love interactive notebooks, but you just want to know more. Also, please keep in mind that this is actually part two of, um, of a two-part webinar series I've done for interactive notebooks. Part one is available to watch anytime for free. And I've got the um, link for that at the bottom of the screen. It's a shortcut and I'll give that to you again at the end of the webinar. So don't worry about um, getting that jotted down right away. Uh, I want to take a minute to go back and let you know what was discussed in that first webinar, just in case you kind of feel like there's some holes in this one or you have more questions you'd like answered. I'll tell you what we went over there. Um, and if you've already, um, if you've already seen it, um, it just kind of a little refresher. So in the first webinar, we discussed the why behind notebooking, why it's worth your time and trouble, getting supplies, um, especially on a budget. Um, I will say that now before school starts, when all of the school supplies are on sale, is the best time to stock up. I always get uh, extra interactive notebooks, glue, anything I need while it's on sale, um, I buy in bulk planning interactive notebook activities. We talked about how to organize the notebook, what goes in the notebook, and actually more importantly, what doesn't go in the notebook, how to set up the table of contents and make it work for you, what goes on the left side, on the right side, and, and what your options are for each. We discussed gluing, including which type of glue to use, only Elmer's school glue, not glue sticks. And I'll talk about that a little bit today too. Um, and printing templates for your active notebook and other activities to fit in the notebook. And of course, how to set up the notebook for the beginning of the school year. And once again, I provided the link for that webinar if you wanna go back and, and watch that. Uh, you will wanna stick around today till the very end. Um, I'm gonna share with you this free template pack that includes 60 free interactive notebook templates that you can download and use and customize for any grade level, for any subject. It, it doesn't matter what you wanna use it for. Um, you can do it with these templates. There's no purchase required for these free templates. I'll just share a download link with you towards the end of the presentation. Now, here's a quick look at what we're gonna discuss in today's webinar. We'll talk briefly about structuring your lessons, absent students, slow moving students, lost notebooks, which is, let's be honest, probably the worst thing that can happen, um, new students who join your class in the middle of the school year, and lots of other tips and tricks and hacks just to help keep interactive notebooks running smoothly in your classroom. Let me start very briefly by sharing a little bit with you about how and why I started interactive notebooks. And if you're already using them, you probably have a similar story too, I would guess. So before interactive notebooks, I taught for eight years and I had finally landed my dream job. It was a job I was perfect for and I knew it. I knew I would love teaching middle school reading. Um, I would be teaching sixth, seventh and eighth grade literature. So that summer I spent the entire summer reading everything I could get my hands on. I read all three anthologies front to back. I wanted to read all the stories so that I could only pick and choose the best stories that the kids would love. I was gonna skip the, the boring, terrible stories. And um, I read all the novels that I had available to me. I read all the novels that others recommended to use for class novels. I just wanted to make sure my class was interesting. I wanted my students to love reading as much as I do and to love the things that we read. I wanted, um, so I thought that the reading selections would be the most important part of teaching reading. And I thought that by choosing the right stories and novels, I would be good to go. And so I did all that prep work and about a month into the school year, I realized something, it was not working. Um, I totally stunk 
the reason is because I was doing the same thing that the middle school teacher did before me when it came to teaching content. Um, so I was lecturing and giving notes when it was time to teach anything. Anytime I had information I needed my students to remember, we would get out their notebooks and I would dictate or put up notes on the projector and they would write them down, the straight, old school, boring style. And so the next day when they didn't know the information or when they couldn't find it, I was honestly surprised every time. I spent most of those first few months teaching and reteaching the same information. They were bored. They couldn't remember what I taught them. They couldn't find the information in their notebooks. It was really, it was a hot mess. And what I'm showing right now on the screen is an example of one of my students' notebooks. Actually, um, this is from the first year that I taught middle school literature, and that is my son's notebook. He was one of my students, which was interesting, and that's a topic for another day. But I was able to pull his notebook and look at it, and here's what it looked like. So um, I taught point of view with reading. So here's the notes you can see for that in the middle in this typical middle school boy handwriting. You can also see that, let's see, at the bottom that looks like a writing activity, and at the time I did not teach writing, so that shouldn't have even been in that notebook. Another notebook was where that should have been. That's a whole other issue. There's also answers for an assignment and another page that was just something he scratched out. I don't know what that's about. The point is, though, his notebook was just full of random things. It, there were missing pages here and there. It was definitely not organized. And anytime I needed him or any student to find information, they had a very hard time doing that. So when it was time to have a test on point of view or require him to remember or find the information, he was lost. He would sit there looking through page after page in his notebook just to find the notes. And this is really an accurate representation of most of my students' notebooks. So towards the end of that school year, um, that was the first year I was teaching middle school literature, a kindergarten teacher, I worked in a pre-K to eight school, a kindergarten teacher uh, mentioned to me that she'd been to a workshop on foldables. And so she showed me some things and I was really intrigued and I asked her to, to explain more, and she did. One of my sons was in kindergarten that year, actually. And I started thinking that maybe this was something that would work with middle schoolers just as well as kindergartners. So I learned everything I could find. Um, I tried a few things towards the end of that first school year. And what I found was that it made a huge difference almost immediately for my students. All of a sudden they were interested in what we were learning. They were engaged. They liked what we were doing. So just that little bit towards the end of the year was enough for me. This time we were back to summer. I spent this whole summer um, not preparing what we're going to read, but how I would teach every concept I had to teach using interactive notebook lesson. So I had several lessons ready to go for the school year. And that was, it turns out, the best use of my time. So by the next school year, I was ready to go full force with interactive notebooks. And now my class no longer consisted of drowsy and bored passive learners. All of a sudden, they were really busy. They were active and they were happy. They were actually trying really hard to keep up with me. So they were constantly, constantly busy. They were retaining the information. They could find the notes that I gave them. Um, the notes were organized. They made sense. My students were smiling. They were engaged with the content. Their notebooks look more like the ones you're looking at now. The information was organized. It was easy to find and it made sense to them. And when they made the foldables, when they made the interactive notebook pages, they kind of interacted with the with the information in a way that was more than just writing words on a page. Um, they knew what was expected. They knew what they were supposed to learn and what they had to remember. And let me tell you this, the, the way of teaching, like I said, the way they interact with the notes themselves made the biggest difference because it really leveled the playing field between high and low achievers. All of a sudden, everyone was able to access the information. Um, everyone had it together. It was such a huge difference right away. So this is the reason I continued to use interactive notebooks. They're absolutely the best way to keep students engaged and help them in the process, help them to process um, the content that you're teaching. So let's switch gears and jump right into how I structure my lessons from day to day, what that looks like in my classroom. Um, this is a question I get asked all the time. If you're going to use interactive notebooks, do you have to do an interactive notebook lesson every day? 
a lot of people think that or have that impression that is absolutely not true. For whatever subject I teach or however many subjects I teach that I'm using interactive notebooks for, we add a page to the notebook about once a week. So um, for example, most recently I taught reading in English to sixth graders. So they had one notebook for reading and one notebook for English. So um, there were actually two notebooks that they kept for my class. And I'll talk a little more in a, in a bit today about how I organized that. So um, the reason I separated them that way was because that's how their grade was put in. They had one grade for English, which was grammar and writing, and they had one grade for reading. And then we did vocabulary, but that was, that was separate also. That was in place of spelling. So we would typically do about two pages a week, one for English and one for reading. Vocab, like I said, vocabulary was separate and it was routine based, so they didn't take up class time. But they did have vocabulary interactive notebooks. Um, so anytime I taught new content, which like I said, was about once a, week, once a week, they would put a page in their notebook. And that wasn't every week. And some weeks there were two pages, but that's a good average rule. So all of our class time every day was absolutely definitely not consumed with um, constructing interactive notebook pages. And when students are actually um, constructing their pages, how do you give directions so they aren't constantly lost or asking questions? This is um, another really important part of my lesson. I always worked along with them using a document camera. So for pretty much every lesson, I complete the page as they're completing it too, under the document camera while they're watching. And I included here the one that I love and actually um, bought myself to use. Uh, because the last school that I worked for didn't provide one. Uh, um, at the school before that, I had the Hovercam T3, and that's a good one too if you can find it. I actually prefer the T3 a little bit more, but this one was good too. Um, so step by step, I would have my students watch me construct the interactive notebook page while they did it themselves. Even middle schoolers, I would walk them through every step. I would never ever say, here's an activity, go do it. Um, because this is actually the it's replacing lecture. So this is, this is the activity. This is me teaching them um, as they're writing. I'm talking about the different, um, whatever it is that, if it's point of view, I'm, we're I'm giving examples and discussing it with them as we're constructing and writing the whole lesson. I cut, they cut, um, they watch how I glue, they watch where to do everything. Uh, during the lesson, I'll show them, you know, what to do next. I'll walk around, make sure that they're doing what they should be doing. The whole process takes a little bit. I'm sure you know that if you've, if you've done one before. Um, because I do this for every single class, even when I teach the same lesson to more than one section, I myself maintain one separate notebook for each class that I have. So I always complete mine right along with them. And I'll always have that to use it as an example when I need it. And, and I'll explain to you how that comes up. So the next question, do you complete an elaborate interactive notebook page for every lesson you teach? Sometimes you do have to teach something and you don't have 45 minutes to construct a page. You just need the kids to get the information down in their notebook. So the answer is, you know, of course you don't have to. There are other ways to get information in the notebook without doing a full fancy template every time. Um, especially when materials are review, sometimes I won't complete the whole song and dance with the fancy version of the lesson. So for example, this is a poetry terms review that I did with my eighth graders. And I'd already taught poetry to them. I'd already taught all of these concepts. So I just um, typed this up real quick, made it the right size for the notebook, and had them fill in the answers. And so in just 10 minutes or so, they could glue it in their notebook. They had the definitions they needed to um, close read the poem we're going to do. It was in their notebook. They had the information, but we didn't have to do the whole song and dance lesson. So especially whenever it's um, a review material, it's okay if you even just have them old fashioned style, not all the time, just when you have to, you know, jot notes down. And we'll talk about some other easy ways to get information in the notebook today as well. So it doesn't always have to be interactive, perfect, um, sample lesson you know that you'd want to show off uh, it doesn't always have to have flaps that flip open or does something just to be worthy of being in the notebook any content needs to be in that notebook that you teach because for my students their notebook is their textbook for my class it's got everything in there a quickie lesson is, is this is just another example of um, like a basically a 2d template that you can use and um, i'll tell you more about that too a little bit later so let's move on to absences. I think this is the question I get asked most 
uh, most often by far is what about absent students? And what you're going to do, what your routine will be for absent students will definitely depend on whether or not your school has procedures in place or protocol for absent students. Mine did. Um, so I'll explain to you what, what mine was and, and how I handled it. So the school where I taught, um, a purple sheet would be sent home each day that a student was absent. So the sheet was passed around through the teachers, um, and we each wrote down, you know, what had to be done, what they missed, um, for sure what they had to have done when they came back to class. So I would use this opportunity to have the student let's say they missed the day that we did the interactive notebook activity. So I would have them do whatever they could at home to prepare so that when they came back the next day, they were ready to just finish the template and it didn't take too long. So specifically, I'm gonna have him do the coloring and the gluing at home. You're looking at a template that we might complete in class. So as you can see, I just wrote the color, like he has to color the section orange and section red. Um, just easy instructions I'll handwrite on there and what to color, what color. A lot of things are color coded, color coded, excuse me, in my class. So it's important that they get the right color. So if it's on there, I'll put it on there if it matters. And then um, you'll have to cut it out and bring it the next day just like that. If you can't send home work for absent students or if no one comes to get it, which is sometimes the case, you could just ask another student, an early finisher, a fast worker to, hey, color and cut out an extra template. And that's going to accomplish the same thing. It's not as good because the student didn't do it himself. But at least when he gets back, he can do the important part and add the notes himself. He can glue it in his notebook himself. Um, and he's got a template that's already ready to go. Um, you know you've got students who were with it and who are going to be, you know, sitting there finished early. In fact, um, for me, eventually, it doesn't take long, when a student is absent, the kids always know. And they'll offer, can I, you know, can I do an extra one for so-and-so who's not here? And so if I, if I know that they won't be doing it at home that night, absolutely I'll have that student do it. So my kids actually kind of manage this for me, which is super duper helpful. And here's something that will definitely help you with absent students if you're using any of my interactive notebooks. Um, I have a YouTube channel that includes how-to videos for all of the notebook activities that are 3D. So um, I do have the grammar going up right now and vocabulary will be coming um, in just a few weeks. So with this, you can simply instruct the students to watch and complete the activity at home. Um, just send them the link to the YouTube video or post the link, the video in Google Classroom, and they can actually complete the video themselves, complete the activity, the folding and gluing part themselves. You'll still have to um, get the notes to them, but this shows you how to, you know, where to write the notes. So um, if you are having technology problems, if your document camera is out or you don't have one yet, you can also use this um, in place of the document camera. Um, or you can just pull it up on a uh, computer in your classroom and sit a student there that was absent and say, here, watch this and do this. And it's, it's pretty easy for them to catch up that way. So, um, and then there's quick notes, uh, which like I talked about before, it's, um, I have these for all of my interactive notebooks. And instead of being a 3D template, it's just 2D to where they fill in the notes and they can color it if they want to, and then cut it out and glue it straight in the notebook. This is great for absent students. This is great for um, when you're in a hurry and you just need a little quickie lesson. Um, it's great for kids with modifications because they are pre-filled. It's great if you're using digital interactive notebooks because there's a digital option too. And it's perfect uh, for um, like crisis type problems, like a lost notebook, which we'll get into. All right, so let's keep going and talk about slow movers. While using interactive notebooks, the slow students, um, if you're not careful, they can become your biggest pet peeve. Um, some of us just move more slowly than others. I, I know we all know that. So um, slow movers, uh, like I said, it's a problem a lot of people have asked me for advice on, so I included it here. First of all, don't let your students spend any significant amount of time on coloring. It's not a coloring book. A color matters. I do want the pages to be colorful. I, I rarely, if ever, have my students put in a page that's not colored in some way. So I do think that coloring is important, but uh, we're not going to spend more than just a few minutes on it. And so I'll always say, throw some color on it, um, just color it in real fast, and then we're moving on, that's it. Um, 
there's always a time limit. You've got two minutes to color this and then we're going to move on and it's never much time. Uh, if they don't have enough time to finish it or be perfectionist, they can come back later and I tell them that. You can do that at home if you want to make it look prettier. Some of your students really will and that's fine, um, but it's not going to be during class. Um, also, put your slowest mover right next to you. Um, I'll have the document camera in the front of the room and then right next to my document camera table is my slowest student in the, or students in that class. I'm always right there to make sure he's moving along and um, I help him keep up. Uh, I say him, it's a lot of times a him, sometimes it's a her. Um, I like having that student right under my nose. And you're always going to have those super with it students, like I said before, that do what they have to do quickly and then they're just sitting there. So let those students get up from their desk and walk around their area to assist other students that need it. There is, this is something that's always allowed in my classroom. Um, it, it's a little bit hard at first to kind of let go of some of that control, but I do find that the activities just run way more smoothly when students are allowed to help others just around them, especially a lot of those girls that just like to get up. I'm stereotyping again, I'm sorry. They like to get up and, and see what other people are up to, and this kind of gives them a chance to do that too. So no one ever complains about getting help, and a lot of my students are always eager to help. So finally, you can always assign the first part of the foldable as homework. And I'll do this actually uh, quite a bit, especially if we're running behind. So I'll assign, just like I showed you before, with the um, absent student, before the students leave for the day, I'll just show them, I'll give them a template and I'll say color this and cut it out and bring it to class the next day uh, ready to go. And so that's going to trim like 10 to 15 minutes off of our lesson, depending on, you know, how complicated the template is. Um, it's, it's a huge time saver and your students are doing work at home that's not frustrating. Um, they're not, it's not tedious. I mean, they can do it while they're watching TV or listening to music or relaxing. You know, it's not stressful homework and my students don't complain about this type of homework. Um, if they come to class and haven't done it, then, you know, that's another issue, but they'll just have to be behind and catch up. That's their problem. Um, all right. Oh boy, so next we're gonna talk about lost notebooks, which let's face it, this is pretty much the worst thing that can happen interactive notebook wise if you are using them in the classroom. So the most important part of this plan for me is that you have to freak out. Like you have to just completely like, you know, exaggerate, oh my goodness, you, it's a huge deal. You cannot believe they lost a the notebook. I'm sure it's just left at home. Um, and also keep in mind that you're gonna make this a hassle for the student, it's not for you. Make sure they know that it's, it's really not your problem, but it's gonna be a big problem for them and let the other students see that it's a big problem for them. So of course, at first, you're gonna just assume it's left at home. This happens. Um, I do have my students take their notebooks to and from class every day. I know a lot of teachers prefer to keep them in their rooms and that's kind of a, a game time decision that you have to make. I don't because my students need theirs for homework, for um, studying, for anything they do, literature, um, ELA related, they're gonna need that content information. So they keep theirs with them. So uh, like I said, uh, assume it's just left at home and um, it's in the locker, wherever, just don't panic right away. So what do you do when you have um, a class of 25 students and five of them may show up to class with other notebook? It's not gonna be a big hitch in your plans. It's no big deal. I mean, obviously you don't tell them that, um, but, so while it's missing and temporarily lost or while they just forgot it today, what you do if you're doing um, a notebook lesson is just have them complete whatever you're doing with everyone else on loose leaf paper. So if you take a regular sheet of loose leaf paper and you cut off the top part that's above the margin without lines, and then if you cut off the left gutter side where the holes are, where that red line is, cut on both of those red lines, and then you have left the perfect size page to fit in a composition notebook, which is what we use. So then they'll use that to do their activity on. And then once they finish it, they'll put their name on it. And then I have a folder in my room that the students will put, they won't take this with them because they lost the notebook. We're not going to take chances on this. So they'll leave that page actually with me that day. And then it's in a certain spot. It's in a folder that, that's just for those um, types of activities. So the next day 
or whenever it is they come back with their notebook, they'll go grab it and they'll glue it on the right page in their notebook and it's like they never miss anything, no big deal. So that's how I handle it temporarily. Now, after about a week or more has passed and everyone's convinced the notebook has taken a permanent hike, it's gone forever, it's not coming back again, you're gonna have to handle it like a new student. Um, this is all part of the freaking out phase where you just can't believe it's so awful they lost a notebook. Um, you're so upset you can't believe it, like I said. The students have to know that you are in agony. Um, it's a horrible thing they've done to themselves. And um, I always want my kids to kind of be surprised when this first happens, you know, to be surprised at how upset I am. Not in a mean way, but just in a kind of a shocking way. Um, and we're going to talk about new students uh, next. So like I said, the worst case scenario is just you'll have to treat it like a new student. And the student is going to have just a big hassle on his hands because he lost that notebook. So here's what to do when you have a new student, or like I said, um, if you're just following the new student protocol for a student who has lost its notebook. So over the summer, even if my students um, have to bring their own supplies, like we have a supply list, I will purchase several, at least 20 or 25, if you've got multiple classes, interactive notebooks over the summer when they're 20 cents or 25 cents or even 50 cents uh, at Walmart or Target. So I'll get several extras. That way, if a student loses his notebook and we have to do this protocol, or if a new student comes, I will just pull it out of my closet and hand him a notebook. And that part is no problem. I don't have to go buy one or wait for him to bring one. So you stocked up over the summer. You give him the brand new notebook. Or like I said, the first day he comes, here's a notebook. This is for my class. And then I'm going to hand him my notebook, the notebook that I keep for that class that he's in. It's got the table of contents organized. I'm gonna have him set up the table of contents, identical, copy my table of contents, word for word, page for page. He's gonna number his pages identically to how mine are numbered, our pages are numbered. This is all stuff that I talk about in the first webinar. The first new pages um, were for table of contents. Uh, so on every other page, he'll write the topic. So like, let's say page four was point of view, page five was the plot diagram. Um, so he'll go ahead and write the topic and the page number on the pages that, that he's missed from you guys, from the rest of the class. And it's just a placeholder. So he has his notebook set up when he's finished. He's got the table of contents. He's got all of the pages numbered and he's got the topic. So he knows what he's missed. He knows what notes are missing. And that's all we can do for right now. His notebook is a skeleton. And so then you're gonna just simply pick up where you are today. I know he has a lot of information missing, but we're not gonna deal with that right now. Uh, he's gonna jump right in wherever you are. So what about all of the empty pages? So remember that the interactive notebook is a record of what your students have learned in your class's school year. And since this student is brand new, his notebook should be blank because he hasn't learned anything from you in your class. And um, to just go back and add information for him in the notebook without reteaching it, um, without knowing if he's mastered this, this skill or if he understands these concepts or not, would not be genuine. So I don't actually recommend doing that. I don't recommend having a notebook ready and completed just in case a kid shows up and needs one or loses one at all, because this should be a reflection of their work. You, you don't know what the student has done or learned before he came to you most of the time. And I, I once had a student come in the middle of the year to seventh grade and he, did not even have reading in his school. He took French immersion. So he was a blank slate. He knew nothing of the middle school reading concepts or grammar or writing or anything. What you'll do as you're going through the rest of the year with that student is when you see a deficit in, 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 in things or when you need him to have a page because you're going back to it that day, you'll just have him do the activity then or you'll just have him copy the notes then. Um, this is where it comes in handy, like I talked about, to have a quick notes template or to just have um, a page of notes typed up that he can glue in his notebook and have that because it's better than nothing. And so, you know, what you do in those situations will depend on the student, um, but you're only going to go and fill in the information that he needs to have and the rest of the pages you won't worry about. And you'll only do it as you review the information with him. And when we get a new student, often you know, we'll spend the rest of the year having to kind of go back and worry about what he's had or hasn't had, especially um, in a subject like um, ELA, where everything kind of builds on what you've taught. And that's just kind of how it is. So that's how I handle new students or lost notebooks. Let's talk about some um, hacks to make interactive notebooks in your class run more smoothly. 
First of all, you'll want to consider using a generic template pack to make things easier. Uh, the free bonus that you're going to receive at the end of the webinar actually comes from this free template pack that I've, I've got. Um, have it ready to go even if you haven't planned for or if you're not completely ready you can always pull a page from um, blank runoff template so let's say you're teaching a concept today that has five parts or five terms so you could just pull any template that has five slots or five tabs and and use that and so if you have some runoff in your room then um, if you failed in the planning part or you just want to add something to the notebook on the fly it's super easy to do in a pinch if you're ready for that and while we're talking about that, let's look at gluing for a minute. I just kind of threw this slide in here because I didn't talk about it. Um, in case you skip the first webinar, here's a really important visual for you on glue. I give my students explicit instruction on gluing. Yes, even middle school students, because if you don't, they're going to do it wrong. They're going to have a mess. They're going to have a wet, wrinkled up notebook from doing this toaster strudel style mess this is like you don't ever do this or use big giant dots just little small dots about an inch apart are all you need and the notebook will not um, wrinkle up the pages will not stick together the glue will not seep through I do use Elmer school glue and not glue sticks because um, as I tell my students that glue sticks are temporary because they are if it, the notebook gets hot um, or even if you change your mind, if you're if you glue something with a glue stick, you can change your mind a minute later and just pull it up and it's fine. And so since these are templates that the kids will be interacting with and and moving and and you know flipping up, if you use glue sticks, they're gonna they're gonna come off eventually. So if you use Elmer's school glue, this stuff lasts. I tell my students forever. It sticks forever. You know that once you glue something down. If you change your mind in 30 seconds, it is tough luck. It is not coming off the page. Um, and so I'm sure it has something to do with science, which is not my subject. But Elmer School Glue, it lasts forever. So we, we use that. Um, I keep it in my classroom. They don't have to bring it because with middle school students, it would, it would um, be a mess in their backpacks. So I keep those on hand. Um, so the next hack is similar to using the generic templates I talked about. That are already run off except for if you don't even have that but you've got some post-it notes then you can make a very easy interactive notebook page um, like I said super on the fly or last minute just keep several pads of post-it notes um, handy so just like I said before if you if you have a concept that has that you have five words or if you have five parts or, or whatever it is then just give each student five post-it notes have them folded up like they would a tab and um, I do have them glue it down the post-it note brand does stick the best as I'm sure you all know but I still have them put a couple dots of glue on it just so that it stays forever uh, because if you don't they might come up and then um, with these there's there's not even any cutting involved they'll just fold the tab up and write the word or concept on the front and then under the tab they'll write the definition or the notes or whatever it is uh, these work for all sizes of post-it notes you can use the shapes you can use whatever you want we talked about some slow students or students that might have trouble keeping up. Um, try putting them into small groups to complete notebook activities. Slower students uh, can get the support they need from other students instead of always um, you, especially in a small group setting. So if we're gonna be doing a, um, a template that day that's just gonna be a little bit extra tricky to follow along with, I will have my students um, put their desks in groups without really even explaining to them why. And so simply by sitting this way, it kind of makes some students pay attention to what others are doing. Um, that helps them keep up, but it also helps them see when their friend kind of needs help and they can help them out without um, anyone really kind of noticing, I guess, what's going on. So this naturally makes them help each other. If you can manage it, um, control wise this is always a good thing to do when you're getting started with interactive notebooks too and just kind of let them help each other um, unless it's too much of a distraction for your students now um, the envelope so let's talk about why you're going to need one of these so I told you earlier that I will have my students sometimes um, start a template at home and then finish it in class there's also some times where um, I don't ever plan to straddle two days. Like I always want it to be 
you know, we start that day, we finish that day, but that doesn't always happen. There could be an assembly that you forgot about or a fire drill or, or anything could happen and your students will need to pack up right away. So you can use this uh, manila envelope. It's a six by nine size uh, on the right hand right here. It fits perfectly in the back of their um, composition book. We glue it down with Elmer's glue and it stays forever. Like I told you before, this can get kind of expensive if you're buying it for all of your classes. And so another option is just to make one of these um, pockets uh, on the last page. And I used two pages, so I kind of doubled up. Um, they're super easy to make if you just go to YouTube and type in how to make a notebook pocket. Um, it'll come right up. I've done it. It's super easy. Um, I've used both methods, and I've never had a problem with either. So whatever is more convenient for you works fine. Another hack is... Uh, to try using lap books. So um, sometimes you'll want to do an activity that's a foldable um, an interactive notebook template, but it doesn't necessarily need to stay in their interactive notebook. Maybe it's something that they don't need to refer back to. It doesn't have to be in there. You can use um, a manila folder instead, just like this is, um, this example is actually something um, from the movie Homeward Bound, where we did a literary analysis of the movie. And so they have different parts of the plot, the roof um, is, is a plot diagram, the tree is a theme tree. So they have, um, they actually have answers on here and it's not something they would need to refer back to because it's not notes for finding theme. It's not the parts of the plot, the definitions themselves. So um, sometimes you can just have them put it, like I said, in the middle of a folder, which they kind of seem to always have around school or the big sheets of construction paper, like the big size, it's, it's like two regular sheets put together. The kindergarten teachers always have those, plenty of those. And so you can use um, one of those as well if you don't have a manila folder for lap books. Um, so let's talk about the um, free templates that will help you get started with interactive notebooks in any subject, any grade. Um, so if you simply type in this web address, uh, I tested it again before the webinar, it's good to go. If you type this in, it'll let you download um, this template pack make sure you enter in um, the capital letter. So it's capital L, capital L, capital B, bonus 99. Make sure you enter in, uh, it, it is case sensitive. So uh, when you download these, I'm gonna show you what that looks like and how you can use it. First of all, you'll see a folder of PNG files, which is what these are. Um, and these, uh, use the folder of image files, the PNGs, if you want to pull this into a Word document, which can actually get kind of tricky. Um, or I use PowerPoint. If you want to like uh, type on top of them or add clip art, you can do that. Whatever desktop publishing uh, program you have. If you just want to print them how they are and maybe write, handwrite on the template or have the students add um, words or pictures themselves, then it's also in a PDF format where you can just click to print the pages you want. I also actually have them ready to go in PowerPoint where you can go and edit them easily. Uh, just open up the PowerPoint file. You can add a text box and type on the tab or the flap. You can pull in clip art or pictures or whatever you need to do. This um, bit.ly link is case sensitive. So make sure you get it just like that. All right, so um, I talked to you early in the webinar in case you missed it. Here is the website again for the part one um, where we talk about getting started if you're brand new to interactive notebooks. Um, if you visit this web address at the bottom of the screen, carsondelosa.com slash brands slash I'm Love and Lit, you'll see that they have some samples of um, the Love and Lit Carson Delosa interactive notebooks. There's one for grammar and there are two for vocabulary. So you can actually download a sample lesson from each to try, see how they're set up. And um, that's available at Carson Delosa. Um, so you can visit the website. Um, they've also got these interactive notebooks at your local school resources shop. So I guess we're going to look at some questions. Yes, we do have a couple questions. So the first question from Jacob is, where did you find the template for interactive notebook? Did you create your own or use a sample and notified? Yeah, so um, I, I did make my own and those are the ones that I share with you, the ones that are just um, plain and generic. There's uh, tabs for, you know, all different numbers of items or, or um, content that you need to present to your students. Uh, you can find a lot of them online free. Um, you can buy, um, I know Teachers Pay Teachers, there are several huge packs with, I mean, so many picture templates, you can't even imagine the stuff they've come up with. So you can just 
look um, online for like notebook templates. You can find them just about anywhere. And like I said before, you can also use post-it notes. You can just have them use plain white paper cut out to show, uh, you know, cut out like, like the templates are. So you have plenty of options for that. Okay, our next question is, um, it says, I have used interactive notebooks and love using them. However, cutting and pasting is extremely time consuming for my students and resource ELA. I'm looking forward to moving towards a digital interactive notebook, especially in my district as one-on-one. -on -one. What are your thoughts on moving digital? Okay, I'm glad that you asked that question um, because it's kind of a, a soapbox a soapbox issue for me, but I won't get on a soapbox too big. So digital interactive notebooks, there's really no such thing. I've used the analogy of a kid playing in dirt before. So, you know, if a kid is outside and he's making mud pies in the dirt, his, his hands are in the dirt, he feels the cool earth, his fingernails are dirty, um, he's, you know, mixing up the mud pie, he can smell it. It's like a sensory experience for him. Um, and interactive notebooks are kind of that way. The reason they benefit students is because they're immersed in the cutting and the gluing as, as much time as it can take up front to get them in the routine. All of that is part of the reason why they're, they're moving um, in your class. They're not sitting still. Um, they're not passive. They're active learners. And so that's all part of it. Even though it seems like it's a big um, step to overcome in the beginning, I promise it does get better. So don't let it um, deter you if your kids are in middle school or fifth grade and they can't glue and cut like they really should be able to. Um, that's all part of it. So um, if that same student that was playing in the dirt were on the computer and he were, he could do the same thing, right? He could do like a simulation of making a mud pie and he could click, um, he could click the screen and pick up the, the water hose and, you know, click to, to put water in the dirt and all that stuff. It just wouldn't be the same. Um, it wouldn't be the same experience he had. And so it's that way for interactive notebooks too. Um, so if you want to have your students keep digital notes, they can, um, but that's not really uh, an interactive notebook, if that makes sense. So you, you kind of moved so far away from the model and you've taken away the part that really, I find, um, makes the difference in my classroom. Um, it, it, of course, it could be interactive just in a different way. You know, it's a digital interactive. And, um, you know, your kids don't have anything physical to show from it. They can't just grab that notebook and, and look something up real quick. They have to, you know, turn on their computer, um, get everything booted up, open the, find the file, open the file. It, it's, it's, it's similar to the notebook, I guess, that um, I showed you first. It's, it's just not the same as having a physical notebook. So, so that's how I feel about digital interactive notebooks. I've seen, you know, some people say they do it and make it work and that works for them, but that's, that's the best advice I can give you because um, I'm sorry. Um, that it, 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 it's just kind of a, an oxymoron, I guess. I hope that was helpful. Okay, and we have just a couple more. One is asking, how would you set up a three subject notebook? A section for vocabulary, a section for content, and something else, or do you recommend a one subject notebook? Okay, that's a good question. So um, a spiral notebook, which is what you're talking about here, because uh, three subject or one subject would be, would be spiral. Um, those are kind of tricky. I, I only use composition notebooks. I understand if you, if you were already kind of into it this year and you know, you have what you have. And so you can make it work. I do prefer uh, composition books because students um, won't tear pages out. The pages won't fall out. They won't, you know, get loose. Um, they won't use it for other classes. They kind of keep it sacred for your class. So I do prefer composition books, first of all. But if you've got Spiral, that's okay. Um, I would not set up different sections necessarily. And I have always just used, I've even um, taught all of ELA with just one notebook. So if we're going to do a grammar lesson today, that'll be in the notebook. If we do a reading lesson tomorrow, that'll be in the notebook. And I just have them make a table of contents. And so every day we add to it, they'll just write on the next line, you know, um, page 12 is going to be uh, subjects and predicates lesson. And so they can always find it. They don't need necessarily to have different sections, if that makes sense, as, as, as long as it's all ELA and it's all in one notebook. I wouldn't mix like, you know, reading and math together, but if it's all for your class, um, or, or, or ELA is all similar enough, ELA reading. So you don't have to break them up into different sections. If you do, then what's going to happen is you'll have more students putting things where they don't belong in the wrong section and then they can't find it. 
um, it becomes an issue with numbering pages for the table of contents. So I, I prefer just to have it all um, together, kind of mixed in. And, and that table of contents is how they can always find what they need. Uh, even if one page is grammar, the next page is reading, the next page is writing, that's totally okay. So yeah, I wouldn't have a break it up like that. Okay, and then I have another question that says, do you designate left and right pages for teacher input and student input? That's actually a really good question. I'm thinking if I have one, um, I can reach and show you, but I don't think I do. Um, so my students, I, I know that um, some teachers do it differently. My interactive notebooks are like, that's my student's textbook for my class. So there's nothing that they're going to do in that notebook themselves, if that makes sense. They're never going to like internalize it and write how they feel about it or whatever. Um, they're not going to do that because it might be wrong. And I always want them to be able to go back to their active notebook and check that for accurate information. So everything they do in there is just, um, it, it's, it's very scripted. Um, now the left side we will use sometimes, uh, you know, I'll always have them um, just use the right page and sometimes the left is blank. Sometimes on the left side, I'll have them um, most often actually put a graphic organizer there or um, some something similar to that where they've kind of used the information and here's a sample. So for example, um, uh, if I give them a lesson on plot, um, and so the right side would be all of their, um, it'd be the plot diagram where they have, you know, what is rising action, what is the climax, how to find those. So on the left-hand side would be an actual plot diagram for a story that we read together and we did the plot diagram together um, and so the graphic organizer is glued on that page so that they can come back and look and see, okay, when we read this story, the climax was, was this. Um, and it'll help them in the future when they refer back to those notes to have an example of what I expect. So once they have that graphic organizer on the left side, I can give them the same graphic organizer for any story we do and expect them to figure it out themselves with just the notes and the sample they have in their notebook. Um, I do talk a lot about other options for the left hand side um, in the first webinar. Um, sometimes it'll be just a worksheet that we did related to that topic. I'll have them glue it in there. Um, but I don't do the whole input output model. And the reason is because I don't want them to do anything in the notebook that I haven't approved. And I do not pick up the notebooks and grade them ever. Um, I see them while they're doing them. So I know if they're keeping up or not. Um, we do it together. It's never independent. And um, so I don't have to pick them up and grade them. And oh, that'd be a, an ordeal if I did. <laughs> do you mind going back to, um, I think it was the previous page with the free templates. I think a couple people wrote it down wrong and they just went. Yeah, sure. There you go. Okay, perfect. And it looks like we might have one more question and then we can announce the winners. Um, okay. How many pages do you leave in the beginning for the table of contents? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, so just, I would leave three pages and you won't need more than like one or maybe two, but I'll always leave three pages um, before we start numbering off for the table of contents. Okay, perfect. Um, you will be able to get this recording. Um, I will send it to Aaron and we will also have it on the Carson DeLosa YouTube channel. And I'm sure we're going to post it on social media as well. Um, so you will be able to get a copy of this webinar through there. Um, and you can also email me back through the webinar link that you originally got and I can send it your way as well. I would say give us about a week um, just so we can make sure everything is all good with it and um, we will post it after about a week. Um, one other thing, I know a couple of people were asking um, about other subjects. So Erin does ELA. Um, but we do offer on Carson DeLosa or through your local retailer, we offer um, several interactive notebooks with math and um, science and, and other subjects. So that's just a, a couple questions that we did receive um, regarding that. So thank you, Erin, so much for doing this webinar. We all appreciate it. Thank you so much.